Hi folks, slotting stainless steel with a 1 8 inch end mill. The goal of this video is to come up with a good recipe. So let's walk through why and how we selected this particular end mill to start with, how we get that initial success recipe, and then how we grow from there to get a recipe that meets the goal, whether it's process reliability, i.e. just not breaking the tool, higher removal rates, or surface finishes. And we're gonna do this testing on two separate machines, mostly because one has a fog buster and the other has flood coolant. And when we're slotting and when we're cutting in stainless steel, it's a pretty big difference. Let's dive in. When you have a specific application, especially a more challenging one like slotting and stainless steel, it's worth ensuring that the tool you pick is designed for that process. Helical makes that easy. We'll go to products, by material, stainless, slotting. What's relevant for stainless steel is that usually the grind on an end mill designed for stainless steel is quite different than it would be for a tool steel or a mild steel. We're slotting, so the best options are a four flute chip breaking rougher, a three flute variable pitch, or a four flute variable pitch. From experience, I've found, especially with the smaller diameter end mills, like a 1 8 inch, fewer flutes is a better option because fewer flutes means there's a larger gullet, which means there's a larger area for that chip to form and then evacuate. And usually what kills your tools in slotting is recutting those chips because they haven't been evacuated. So three flute, variable pitch. We have two options, corner radius or square. If a corner radius is acceptable, I recommend it. We're going to go with the option that has a 10 thousandth of an inch corner radius. So it's quite small. For most of the work we do, that's more than acceptable. And that corner radius makes the tool stronger by getting rid of the weakest point of the tool, which would be the sharp tip on a non-radius end mill. I've got two options with different lengths of cut. I'm going to go with the shorter length of cut because with slotting, that's generally going to be the limitation. So I want the most rigid tool possible. The shorter length of cut means shorter flute length, which increases that rigidity. So two, three, zero, one, one. To get some initial speeds and feeds, there's two different thoughts on this. You can look at standard speeds and feeds charts that most manufacturers come out with. We've got some starting speeds and feeds recipes over on NYC CNC. There's also just sort of a general rule of thumb of usually you're not going to cause a problem starting in the two to 300 surface feet per minute and say 1,000th of an inch feed per tooth. But this is stainless steel and it's slotting. I'd like something a little bit better. Uh, and the Machining Advisor Pro gives us a good starting point for that. I'm going to skip material and instead choose th subgroup type 304. Toolpath is slotting. Got to pick and yield on the material. ER 10,000. We'll say 100. So the starting recommendation is 233 surface feet, which is 7,125 RPMs at half a thou feed per tooth or 11 inches per minute. The first thing I like to do is then see what's the range of recommendations. If I reduce the speed, which will increase tool life, and I reduce the feed for less deflection. What I'm really doing here is saying, what's the most conservative version of this recipe? It's dropping the surface speed down quite a bit to 175, but it's only reducing our feed per tooth by one ten thousandth of an inch. However, don't fall victim to disregarding numbers just because they're small. Dropping it from five tenths to four tenths is still a 20% reduction. The last thing I'll check is what happens with work holding security. Reducing it would drop the feed rate another 10,000th of an inch. It's worth thinking about. We actually have pretty good work holding security in this setup, but again, I like to understand what is the software trying to tell me, because it's not just the piece of material and the vise, but the overall rigidity of the machine tool and the tool holder. Hopping over to Fusion to can this up, got my slot modeled. I'm using the axial recommendation of point one inches or 80% of the tool diameter. One of the things I like about Harvey and Helical is that many of the tools are available for Fusion 360. They don't come downloaded. We'll put a link in the video description. You can download the latest version of those libraries. And what that lets us do is type in the EDP number and drag it over to this file. Only thing I don't like is it doesn't default to any meaningful starting recipe speeds. What we want to do is pull those out of map. So we'll start with 175 and four ten thousandths of an inch. Two D contour. We'll select our tool, 
and I'll click on this inside edge to create a slot. Because sliding is 100% width of cut, it won't matter which direction you go, but I care because of our coolant lines, especially on the fog buster. So I'm actually gonna use this edge because that's gonna move the tool from the front to the back. That has a better point of aim on our fog buster nozzle. Click OK. So we have a linking move that I don't like. It's got a 90 degree move right at the start of the part, which would probably break the tool. So let's fix that. We'll change the lead in sweep angle from 90 to zero. That will move the tool straight into the part instead of coming from the side. But I'm gonna increase that distance. And there's two ways to do that. I can increase it by the linear lead in distance, say make that 0.1 inches. That will cause the tool to move in further and because I have the lead out checked and it's matched to the lead in, it will lead it out 0.1 inches on the tail end. That's more than you need, but I like to see the tool move a little bit before it moves into the cut, especially when I'm testing a recipe. Uh, the other thing you can do to extend a tool path is under geometry. You can choose tangential extension distance. It does the same thing with one difference. The tangential extension distance occurs at the cutting feed rate. The linking moves occur at the linking feed rate. For most of us, it's oftentimes that those feed rates are the same, but you do have the ability to change them. That went great. Listen to the machine. I didn't hear any inconsistencies. It's one way of telling if it's recutting chips. We have some good chip evacuation. So the second cut will run at the base recipe out of Machining Advisor Pro. No problems with cut two. So where do we go next? We can't actually adjust the width of cut because we're slotting. We can't go less, we can't go more. So we can either adjust the depth of cut, i.e. axial depth, or we can adjust surface speed, aka RPM. I'd like to try axial depth for two reasons. Number one, increasing the surface speed would do so at the potential benefit of going faster, but at the cost of either decreasing tool life, or it doesn't say it here, but higher risk of chatter or breaking the tool. The other factor is that at 7,000 RPMs, we're definitely not near the 10,000 RPM max, but I think we'll be able to get a better bang for our buck or more removal rate by testing the axial depth of cut, mostly because we're only at 80% of the tool's diameter right now. And with slotting, oftentimes you can get up to 200%. Depends on a bunch of factors and criteria. And how would you know that if you weren't a machinist? Well, some of these things you just have to learn over time. Ironically, it's the PDF, the standard feeds and speeds from Helical here that does mention full slotting, they recommend the axial depth of cut being 100 to 150%. So we're only at 80 or even half their recommendation. So for the next cut, let's step this up to 100%. Other thing that's important to note when we're testing slotting like this is that the length and direction of the slot you're testing with needs to match your end goal. In other words, don't test on a one or two inch long slot and then expect it to work in a 10 or 20 inch long slot or time in the cut. Likewise, we're testing a slot along the Y axis move here. If your slot is actually along X axis or at a different angle, in this setup particularly, that's going to have a huge impact based on the ability of the fog buster to help evacuate those chips. No problems on that cut, but if you noticed, I was trying to make sure the coolant line was perfectly aimed at the slot and I bumped it out of the way for a split second. I'm honestly surprised the tool didn't break because recutting chips will often lead to pretty quick tool failure. So where do we go from here? We could increase the axial depth of cut to say 125 or 150%. The concern there, especially with the fog buster, is usually I'm not slotting in a straight line and I may not always be paying attention to where my fog buster is aimed. And as you increase that depth of cut, more of the tool is hidden inside the slot, which makes it all the more difficult for the fog buster to help aid in chip evacuation unless it's perfectly aimed 
at the back side of the tool. So the two other variables we can play with, increased surface footage or increased feed rate. The feed rate doesn't move that much from 5 tenths up to 6 tenths, although that is a 20% increase, so it can run a little faster. And this is a time where you've got to decide what's the most important thing for you. Is it not breaking the tool or is it being able to walk away from the machine and know that it may take a minute or two longer, but it should be a recipe that works. Let's keep the axial depth, but try one more recipe where we bump up that feed rate to the six tenths per foot. Taking a look at the tool under a microscope, looking to see if there's any problems, for example, fractured coating or actually cracking on the insert of the edge. Don't see anything that really bothers me. You can tell the tool has been used, that's okay. I made a few test cuts with this tool prior to filming, but that's one of the differences between a stainless steel tool and a steel end mill, is stainless steel benefits from having a sharper tool. It's that sharpness that helps shear the stainless, whereas a tool steel or a steel end mill may have a slightly honed uh, or rounded edge that gives it more toughness. But what that means is that if I lose that sharpness, it's likely going to result in the end mill failing. There's no guaranteed tool life at all, but I also hate it when people won't tell you or give you some idea. So here's what I would say. In aluminum, with free cutting, good chip removal, you may get dozens of hours of cutting in the cut. Go to the extreme opposite on a material like Inconel, you may be lucky to get 20 minutes in the cut. So with a tool like this in stainless steel, I would think something like 30 minutes is probably a pretty good expectancy for time in the cut. It could well be more, but to get more out of it, I'm guessing you're gonna wanna do things like even less run out, something like a through spindle coolant or something that even guarantees better chip evacuation. And again, watching your overall speeds and feeds and surface footage, just to give you some idea of what you might think is a good successful life out of that tool. Let's see if we can increase the axial depth of cut to 150%. You'll notice as we make that adjustment in MAP, it recommends that we reduce the feed rate down to four ten thousandths of an inch feed per tooth or 10 inches a minute. If it fails, we'll move over to the 1100M and see if it's the chip evacuation or coolant that makes the difference. Let's see how this goes. Is, number one, I'm gonna just turn my coolant on to just double check. I like where that coolant is blasting. Um, you can see it right there. It's the stream, literally the stream is aimed right at the tool. If we break this tool here, uh, I suspect it is because of the coolant system, meaning I think the tool itself can probably handle this cut, it, but not if it's not able to evacuate chips. And we have our fog buster turned up a little higher than normal. It's about 17 PSI. Again, the higher pressure is gonna help uh, evacuate those chips. Okay, the tool broke using the fog buster. Let's move over to the 1100M with flood coolant and show that we're gonna be able to push this tool harder because of the flood coolant. Okay, 100% depth of cut worked fine with the flood coolant. Let's step up to 125% axial and let's reduce our feed and speed to hopefully stack the deck in our favor and get a successful cut. Four tenths feed per tooth and 178 surface feet. Same feeds and speeds, but the key with slotting is you've got to test the length of the slot and 
if the tool is changing directions. Everything we've done so far in this video has been a four inch slot where we're only cutting along the Y axis. When we move directions, two things come to mind. Number one, does your machine behave differently, meaning the condition of the Gibbs or the linear motion system. More importantly though, is going to be the coolant. Does the coolant have the same access to flush those chips out? Is it running off for some reason? Is it being blocked? So this test will prove out, number one, can the tool survive longer in the cut? And number two, can we turn a corner? Can we change directions? This is cut 10, 175% depth of cut. I really expect this will break, but that's okay. We're gonna, if it does, it does. Are you kidding me? That's incredible. 200% axial depth of cut. Spoiler alert, we break the tool. Take a look and see if you can see why the tool breaks. I think the tool and the Tormach were both capable of this cut. What happened is we were cutting at the edge of the part. So the coolant is hitting the side of the part, not the face of the part, where it needs to be hitting to actually provide that flushing action. The same thing almost happened to us when we were cutting our longer slot length in the cut slot. So those are the things that you've got to think about when it comes to the process reliability and not just living in a theoretical world of CAD and CAM and feeds and speeds, but really how is your part set up and how are those coolant lines working? I was surprised at how well 175% depth worked, but when it comes back to process reliability, I would recommend sticking with 100% depth, maybe the 125 or 150. What is imperative is your coolant. Coolant does three things. It evacuates the chip, it lubricates the cut, and then actually provides a, a cooling effect. All three of those factors are important, but it's the recutting chips or the chip evacuation, especially slotting on stainless steel that's going to most likely lead to an immediate tool failure. The fog buster works great with that air blast in the mix, except that you can't always have your fog buster pointed directly at the trailing part of the tool path. Stepping up to the dual head fog buster could help, but here flood coolant just wins. It's just better. If you want to up your process reliability or push this harder, upgrade to a higher pressure pump, add more nozzles, or you can see on this Tormach here, the nozzles stop at about four or five o'clock. That's to accommodate the ATC. If you're not using an ATC, modify that to have some flood coolant nozzles come around or make a ring so that you're flushing from all areas. Only time I don't like flood coolant is when it's really low pressure and or you're doing a big pocket where it just creates a swimming pool for the chips to hang out in because then you're recutting them. The last takeaway is that it can actually be helpful to have a little bit more stick out on the tool here. Now that's very counterintuitive. Normally that means keeping the tool as short as possible and using the shortest flute length as possible. Here, the benefit you gain from having a little bit more stick out helps aid in the ability to get flood coolant or the fog buster better aimed for chip evacuation and that benefit absolutely outweighs uh, the sacrifice in rigidity. A lot of the work and research that we're doing here is what we're feeding into our new Speeds and Feeds website, Proven Cut. Proven Cut offers you video speeds and feeds information so that you can watch and listen to the cut as well as one click open the whole cam tool path and speeds and feeds into Fusion 360 to use on your part, your project. You can search by material, by cutting tool, by gauge length, by tool manufacturer, by machine weight, a whole host of filters and criteria. So if you're looking for better speeds and feeds, check out Proven Cut. Otherwise folks, take care. See you soon.